Good morning. As always, it's wonderful to see everyone uh, here today. Please allow me to extend my special thanks to uh, Dr. Evan Walters, President for the Allegheny Campus, and his entire team for again hosting this year's, this fall, Labor and Management Institute's Robert M. Mill Lecture Series. I also like to recognize CCAC Board of Trustees Chair Frederick Tiemann, Bill Flanagan, who serves as the Chief Corporate Relations Officer for the Allegheny Conference on Community Development, and who will also be facilitating today's questions and answers session. And of course, the man of the hour for this lecture series that has made it possible to occur in the fall and the spring, our very own CCAC alumnus, Bob Mill. Please join me in acknowledging these individuals. <laughs> and certainly, I would be remiss if I did not thank our panel as ex of experts here on the stage who so willingly agreed and accept accepted the invitation to share their insights and knowledge for this discussion. The Honorable Camera Bartolotta, Dan Franco, Dave Reed, and Jay Costa, who many of you know also serves on CCAC Board of Trustees. Please acknowledge our panel. <laughs> For CCAC, this discussion could not be more timely, coming as it does on the heels of a recent announcement of the new Collaborative Workforce Initiative designed to address the need for skilled workers in the region. As Governor Wolf mentioned during last month's press conference here at the college, a key part of this initiative will involve the construction of a new training center on the Allegheny campus. Once completed, the center will feature programs that directly align with the 21st century workforce demands, and is being funded in part through the generous support of the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Naturally, this project will draw upon the skill sets of numerous individuals, including the college's many partners in business and the skilled trades to see it through to a successful fruition. We anticipate groundbreaking for this exciting initiative late in 2018. And now it is my pleasure to welcome to the podium Trustee Frederick Tiemann, who will share a few remarks about today's discussion. Trustee Tiemann. Thank you, Dr. Bullock, uh, esteemed panel members and guests. It's uh, my pleasure just to welcome you here on behalf of the CCAC uh, Board of Trustees. I can assure you that we're committed uh, to ensuring that CCAC is a national leader in workforce development and a key part of the educational ecosystem here in Western Pennsylvania. Education has never been more important today, and education has never been more expensive than it is today. And that's why here at CCAC, we're committed to a 21st century workforce development program it's affordable and provides family sustaining wages for our students. It can be the educational foundation by which students become responsible citizens and by which they can advance both in careers or moving on to baccalaureate and graduate degrees. Importantly, 95% of the graduates of CCAC stay right here in Allegheny County. And it's been an economic engine for Allegheny County. For every $1 spent on CCAC, studies show that $4.50 go back into the local economy. And we see this new building that Dr. Bullock mentioned as key uh, to developing even further that educational ecosystem. We are partnering with corporations and educational institutions in Western Pennsylvania to, des to design a program that is meaningful and leads uh, to skilled jobs. If Pitt and CMU, who we're partnering with, can look over the horizon and see what's coming down the pike today, it may be autonomous vehicles, advanced manufacturing, or machine learning, 
who knows what it's going to be five years from now. In partnerships with institutions like that, we can not only look over the horizon and see what's coming, but we can make sure that the curriculum and skill sets are developed so that those jobs of the future, and there will be new jobs in the future, that CCAC is in a position to help ensure that the entire community benefits from those types of opportunities and not just uh, software engineers. So we're excited about those kind of partnerships to, to move this whole region forward. And to talk more about today's uh, panelists and to introduce you to the panelists, it's my pleasure to introduce Bob Mill, often known as Mr. CCAC, a 1973 graduate and part of the first graduating class, was not only a student leader in that class, but it's gone on for nearly three decades as a member of the CCAC Board of Trustees and the Educational Foundation, both of which he currently serves on today as a, an emeritus member. He's been instrumental in developing the Legends program, which has returned over a million dollars into CCAC, and he himself is a lifetime Legends leader. And it's only appropriate that having risen into the highest ranks of Highmark, where he was involved with management and labor much of his career, that this series has been named after him. So it's my pleasure to introduce Bob Mill. Thank you, Fred. I appreciate that. Every time he gives that introduction, I always say that he, he gives it just the way I wrote it. So uh, thank you very much for being here today. As always, I'm, I'm humbled that you're here for this session uh, with my name attached to it. It's a little different this time than you may, those of you who come most of the time, you would see that this panel up here, half of it would be labor and half of it would be management. Of course, that's in the program. It's the Labor and Management Institute. And in the middle of that, between labor and management, is the, is the ampersand. That means and. It doesn't mean labor management or labor management. It's labor and management. Well, today we, we've taken a, a little departure from that because there's a problem in, in Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania in general because we are growing quickly a lot of infrastructure building. I come out of organized labor, dealing with organized labor most of my career, and so that's where my focus is. Uh, as we were putting this program together uh, some seven years ago now, I had a, the opportunity to meet with Morgan O'Brien, the president of People's Gas, and he told me something that I, I will never forget and I repeat it ad nauseum. He said, the thing that keeps him up at night is not gas exploration or finances or any of that. What keeps him up at night is, who's going to connect my pipe? And who's going to make my pipe? And that is stuck in my head. And I want you to know that in, in most of the 50 years of CCAC, this institution has gotten it in terms of workforce development. All the way back into the 70s when the steel industry came apart, it was CCAC that stepped, ahead, stepped forward at the encouragement of the county commissioners and particularly its chairman, Tom Forrester, to say those displaced steel workers need an opportunity to get other skills so that they can go back into the workforce because steel is gone. And that's when CCAC got into the business of workforce development. And then not too long after that, there was a great relationship developed between the college and many of the, the building trades, joint apprenticeship and training committees. And those developments were mind blowing to a lot of people. That a, a, an apprentice and the electricians could go to, through a five year indentured apprenticeship program and, and work the whole time that electrician was in that program. And when he, becomes a journeyman, he or she, they also have an associate's degree from CCAC. I mean, that just doesn't happen around the country. It happened here. And so our concern today is what's going to happen? Who's going to make Morgan O'Brien's pipe? Who's going to connect it? And the part of the problem is, is that we've gone away from skills development K through 12. You know, a lot of us in the room are boomers, and we may have taken 
wood shop or metal shop, mechanical drawing. I took mechanical drawing. I was doing cartoons most of the time, but I took mechanical drawing. And, but that, that has stopped now. And so we, we don't have kids that are going through school that say, I want to be an electrician. I want to be a carpenter. It's not happening. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a problem. And so part of what we want to discuss today is how do we change that K through 12, through the state, through the education department? How do we get people thinking along those lines? I want to tell you what labor is doing as we are embarking on the cracker being built in Beaver County and lots of work being done on the, on the, uh, the locks and dams and, and maybe, just maybe, Amazon, when Amazon comes into, the, where, who's going to make all these buildings? I can tell you that organized labor is way out in front of it. In talking to Bill Watercott from the, uh, from the carpenters, he told me that currently there are 1,200 people being trained by the carpenters right now. Let me repeat that, 1,200 people. Labor gets it. Labor's ready to go. Now we've got to get the rest of this community excited about it. So enough pontification on my part. I'd like to introduce to you the, the panel today. And we are honored to have with us these four excellent representatives of our, of our Commonwealth. First, uh, the State Intergovernmental Operations Committee Chair, the Honorable Camera Bartolotta. <laughs> the Senate Democrat Leader, the Honorable Jay Costa, CCAC graduate. <laughs> the House Democratic Caucus Chair, the Honorable Dan Frankel. <laughs> and the uh, House Majority Leader, the Honorable Dave Reed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's our panel. As uh, you, uh, you know, uh, inside your, your packet, you will find this, and that's a uh, critique form, and also to make recommendations, and you will need this. this. This white card is where you can fill out your questions. When you have a uh, question, just raise your hand up. Somebody from the staff will pick up your card, and they will give them to our good friend, Bill Flanagan, who will be today's moderator. Bill? Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Great to be back with all of you again today. Thank you to the panel for doing this. This is terrific. Um, uh, I think there's a lot to talk about. I actually thought when we scheduled this for this date, knowing what the budget situation was like, that we would either have an hour conversation about nothing but the budget and all those issues, or we would have no conversation at all because they would all still be stuck in Harrisburg today trying to get it done. But fortunately, the legislature managed to uh, get it all resolved over the last couple of days and, and we're able to have this event. And I'm sure all your colleagues rallied around you, knowing you had to be here today to just get it done. And, and we really appreciate everybody uh, for doing that. It, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity. I know the program's called the State of the State, and that's really what we're going to talk about today. We, we may talk a little bit about just the budget and the resolution and your take on where we are as we'll get started, but fortunately we don't have to spend the whole session talking about that. Uh, this, this this, this forum is really about labor and management, and that means it's about growing the economy and jobs, and how do those two meet, and how do we create a more uh, prosperous Pennsylvania for everybody who lives here? And uh, that's what we want to talk about, is kind of where we are, where we're headed, and what these uh, leaders think uh, we should be doing, uh, more of perhaps, uh, to improve Pennsylvania's competitive position. I did a little background just ahead of this, a couple stats that... Uh, might be of interest to everybody. Uh, Governing.com actually about in the last year actually ranked all the states in terms of their economic performance. Uh, Pennsylvania actually ranked 39th, uh, below average in terms of what, what, what do they add up to come up with that ranking 39th among the states? Well, the unemployment rate, the change in the unemployment rate, uh, GDP per capita, the change in GDP per capita, personal income, job growth, all of those factors come into play. And they put uh, Pennsylvania down there, uh, in the, certainly in the lower half among all states in terms of economic performance. CNBC does something similar. They, they rank the, the top states for business. Um, Pennsylvania ranks 33rd. 
So uh, if you're in the economic development business, as my colleagues at the Allegheny Conference and the Chamber of Commerce and the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance are, that makes the job a lot harder. It's a lot harder to sell when you're trying to sell a product that consistently uh, ranks in these national rankings below average in terms of economic performance. So that's kind of where we are, at least by these national rankings right now. On the plus side, uh, when you look at today and tomorrow, uh, there's, some, there's some optimism. Uh, PNC Bank just came out with their latest uh, small business and small and mid-sized business owner survey. They take the pulse a couple of times a year on how, um, on how business owners feel about the future. And the good news is uh, the majority of them are optimistic, uh, the op and that's across Pennsylvania. And uh, their optimism is a little tempered from where it was in the spring, but by and large, they feel pretty good about where we are and where we're headed. And how op optimism, uh, optimism uh, translates into their plans to hire people, which are up. Optimism translates in their plans to pay people, which is also going up a little bit, so that's good. Uh, but what's on their mind, what they're concerned about, is actually what we're here to talk about. It's workforce, it's talent. Where are they going to find the people? to meet the demand that they're beginning to see, the opportunity that they see ahead for their businesses, and, and that's a concern. And uh, no, re uh, no wonder, if you, if you look at the demographic data in Pennsylvania, and perhaps one of the reasons why we're not performing as well as some other states, uh, we're kind of old relative to the rest of the country. Um, although the population, this is interesting, according to, uh, according to the Economic Review of Pennsylvania by the Center for Workforce Information and Analysis, predicts that Pennsylvania's population will begin to grow next year. Uh, after years, it kind of going sideways, so that's the good news. The bad news is the population is going to continue to get older and have more people dependent on the workforce to keep the whole thing afloat. In fact, if you actually look at working age population starting last year and then projected out through 2046, uh, the, the expectation is that our working age population, the people here available to do the work, is going to decline every year through 2046 while our population grows. And that means there's going to be a lot more people dependent on those who are working to generate the wealth it takes to provide all the social services and make sure we can sustain the economy and the quality of life across Pennsylvania. So, so these are big challenges, and, and they're things that uh, hopefully are top of mind to the lawmakers, and that's mostly what I want to talk about today. Your take on kind of where we are, where we're headed. Uh, I can't uh, do this kind of thing from a podium because I'm used to like a television talk show. So <laughs> I have to be able to see who I'm talking to here. Uh, but I, and I want to come back and talk about all that kind of stuff as we go along. But first, we've got to talk a little bit about the budget. You got it done. Congratulations. I'm just going to go down the line. And Senator Bartolotto, I'll start with you. Um, you know, your take on how it got done, what you like about it, if there's anything you're concerned about. Just uh, what do you make of the deal that was finally cut the other night? There we go. Oh, it was on already. Great. Um, well, I'm, I'm the newest one up here. Um, I'm still a freshman senator. This is the first office I've ever held, uh, and the last. So was this an eye opener? Oh, it's for been you? a hoot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the last three years, so I've been told, are extremely unusual. Um, the the first year's budget, I call it the budget baby, took nine months to finally finish. Uh, so it's just it's just been a struggle every single year, and it it's very curious to me as a business owner of 30 years that for some reason. Pennsylvania decides how much money they're going to spend, and then they work really hard and fight about how they're going to raise the money to do so. That's really backwards to me. Um, a, a quote from Jim Christiana, forgive me, it's his, if you're offended, call him, um, at, at a breakfast, I think you know what I'm going to say, he said, that's like wiping before you poop. <laughs> Thank you, Jim Christiana. Um, but it, it just doesn't make any fiscal sense to me to decide what you're going to spend and then find the ways to fill the hole. Nobody does that in business. Nobody does that in their personal budget at home. Uh, you, you'd be bankrupt. So I think we need to find a better way to do that. And thankfully, just this week, we, we passed again um, Senator Mench's bill for a uh, performance-based budget, hmm. which, I mean, you have to at least start there. So I think we really need to get our fiscal house in order. Um, and there's a lot of things we really need to address and a lot of things we need to change. And as the chair of intergovernmental operations, we've got a long, long list of things that we're going to uh, have hearings on and to address to try to wrangle what I call classic dysfunction in Pennsylvania government. Okay. Well, you're, you're, you're the newbie in this. Senator Costa, you've been around for a while. What's your take on what you all just went through and where we are in Pennsylvania? Well, I, I think the point that Senator Bartolotta raised is about the manner um, 
that how we proceeded with a spending bill and then later hoping to close out a revenue package, I think we learned our lesson that that may not be the way we do it going forward. Okay. I think we have to have both of them much more closely together and have understanding and agreement along those lines. You know, at the end of the day, uh, it came down to uh, recognizing that um, we needed to get something done. And um, while as one of the folks who had worked with Leader Reed and, and others, um, we, we just simply had to make tough decisions about doing what needed to be done and, and be able to uh, support some things that may not have been things that we had been supportive of before uh, and to close, close the conversation out. Because I think for the, for the Commonwealth as a whole and I think the residents, um, we, we could just not let the process continue the way it did. And um, so I'm pleased that it's concluded. And I, I kind of thought that we were past all those questions on the budget, but <laughs> at this point. So um, I'm happy to entertain any other type of questions going forward. But, you know, it, it's about building consensus. And it, sometimes it's tough to do. We've got a legislature that, in, uh, that is quite different than maybe it had been years ago. We've got folks on, on extremes more so than we have before. And it makes it more difficult to be able to reach a consensus in the middle. And I think that was really the major driving force the last couple of years. Okay. I, I, Representative Reed, do you think this is going to give you a chance to move on to some other things now? Is that the hope anyway? Well, I think. I, yeah, I think you're up. I think you're up. I, I certainly hope it gives us a chance to move on. I, I do think, you know, when, when I look at the last couple of years, and it's not just in Harrisburg, it's across the country, really. Uh, when you see uh, elected officials come into new positions and they, they look at the challenges and they're surprised by those challenges, I'm often brought back to a course I took at graduate school where we focused on the difference between a political actor and a political scientist. And a political scientist is somebody who, you know, can talk about uh, what should happen, why it should happen, when it should happen, how the world could be, how it should be, what they would like to happen in a utopia. A lot of people, you know, including elected officials, are political scientists on any given day where we get caught up in those sort of discussions. But a political actor does all those type of things that a political scientist does, but then has a responsibility to actually make a decision on how the world would be, how it will be, what it will look like in the future. And I think a lot of people underestimate that responsibility and that power associated with it and often look at the decisions in front of them and you know, view them as too overwhelming to overcome. And they're not. But look, the last five, six years, they're not easy because for decades, people had been delaying decisions on very tough items and the perfect storm came together of a lot of different issues and we actually had people in Harrisburg who had to become political actors when they were too used to be being political scientists. Hmm. And making decisions is not easy. The give and take associated with a compromise to actually get something done in, de in a democracy is not easy to do. Public pension reform, balancing a budget, investing in pre-K, workforce development, economic development, correctional reform. These are not easy issues to deal with. There's a reason they've sat out there for decades because oftentimes people look at these sort of issues and they look too overwhelming. And they say, we'll deal with that another day. Well, eventually another day comes. And we just happen to have a lot of another days come in the last couple of years here in Pennsylvania. It's challenging. It's difficult. It's frustrating. It's also an incredible opportunity. And I think people underestimate that opportunity. Very few folks ever get to be in the position to make the decisions to change those sort of items. We in Harrisburg have been lucky enough the last few years to have had a host of those opportunities. And we've got a few more before us. And we've got a responsibility to take those opportunities seriously. But every time one of those challenges come up, we have to shy away from the political scientist mentality and we've got to get back in the frame of a political actor and make decisions, even if they're difficult, to try to move the ball, our communities and the state forward. Hopefully this week will allow us to move that ball forward to some other issues that we're gonna be talking about in the couple, next couple months, the next couple years that could be beneficial, not just to the state of Pennsylvania, but particularly the Southwestern region of, the, of Pennsylvania. You know, our community has some incredible opportunities and Bill, you highlighted a couple of them 
and Bob, you did too, when you talked about Amazon and the Cracker Plant and some of the high-tech community here in Western Pennsylvania. You look at Pittsburgh now and look at where it was 15 years ago. What an incredible change. Young people wanting to come back to this area, that's amazing. My generation didn't want to. Now they have that opportunity. We've got to see how can we move that opportunity forward. All right. Well, hopefully we can come, as we're going along, we can come back and talk about some of those issues and opportunities ahead. But first, Dan Frankel, your take on all of this. Well, thank you. Um, pleasure to be here today uh, with all of you and my colleagues at the Community College. Um, I supported this budget uh, proposal, but I found it profoundly disappointing uh, in terms of the outcome. And uh, while I agree with, uh, with Dave with respect to the process and what realistic expectations are in order to get things done, it was what was possible at the end of the day. But from my point of view, it's a budget that defers uh, important and difficult decisions that we will have to confront. And that's just not me saying it. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that has been confirmed by uh, the bond rating agencies uh, in, uh, in New York uh, that evaluate uh, the economic soundness of uh, the decisions we make uh, in Harrisburg. And uh, they have uh, given us uh, a failing grade, uh, increasing our bond ratings and making us, I think, uh, less competitive. The decisions that we need to make, and many of them uh, go directly to what we want to do and how we envision the future of Pennsylvania with respect to making critical investments that will address the issues I think that we want to talk about today uh, with respect uh, for workforce read uh, readiness and economic development uh, are really profoundly tied to uh, our budget and the investments and decisions that we make. We have deferred those decisions. Uh, we have not made those investments. We've got a budget done this year, which I think uh, I'm, I'm thrilled not to be torturing uh, everybody in, in the state that has an interest in it, that we, but next year and the years that follow, uh, we will have incredibly difficult decisions to make. We have to work together uh, as colleagues uh, and uh, from different perspectives to do that. But this budget doesn't do that. Um, and uh, we are going to have to face those issues another day. Yeah, that's the other. That's my last budget question before we move on to other stuff. But I do wonder about that. You, you kind of patched this together with some borrowing. Let's see, expanded gaming, uh, gaming, taxing fireworks, a new online marketplace tax, and you managed to cobble all of that together to make it balance out. But next year, uh, you know, is another year, and it's an election year. And are you guys going to find yourself back in the same boat that you were in this year? Is this a, is this a fix or is this a patch? And how are you going to handle that, Dave? Hey, look, I, I think you've got to take each year individually with an eye towards the next year. As Dan had mentioned, it is also the art of the possible. Uh, when you look at the different opportunities that are out there, um, you know, getting through year by year by year is the responsibility that the legislature and the governor has. But we also have the responsibility to look at it from a more visionary perspective. And when you look at our tax code in particular, I think it's high time we probably have a discussion on what a tax code should look like in the year 2017 and beyond. Because most of our tax code was set up 40, 50, 60 years ago. Technology changes, the world changes, the competitive visit business environment changes, the obstacles both workers and employers encounter in the year 2017 is just so much different than it was 15, 20, 25, 100 years ago when some of these items were put into place. You know, the competition that comes along with the business community is different and from different angles. You know, I personally think, and I know the governor has said this, and I know Senator Costa has said this as well, it's probably high time we reevaluate our tax system as a whole, particularly when it is related to the business community. You know, do we want a system that was set up kind of in a piecemeal fashion over a number of decades? Or should we look at a more streamlined system, you know, looking at getting rid of loopholes and exemptions and those sort of things for the sake of lowering the tax rates to be more competitive overall when folks like yourself are looking to try to bring employers into the Commonwealth? So, yeah, how about it, Senator Costa? Can we move on to talk about that, or are you all just on an endless treadmill of dealing with this every year? Yeah. Well, my hope is that we can continue to have conversation about what we need to do going forward beyond just year to year. Uh, I think when we operate year to year, <clears throat> it doesn't allow us the opportunity to think forward in terms of a number of years out where we want to be. The conversation that Leader Reed talked about, I think, has to take place in terms of how we move forward with respect to our business tax climate. Uh, we made some changes this year to the net operating loss provisions. You know, the Supreme Court case came down. 
um, which probably would have been a quarter billion dollar impact to uh, the small business community. We took steps to work to, to modify that as much as we could. Uh, a number of other things along those lines need to be addressed. It's just, it just makes it difficult when we don't have the economy moving in, in the manner in which we want it to be able to do to help us do some of the investments that we want to make in other areas. And we have to take steps along those lines to do that. So, you know, as it relates to next year, I think uh, given what was done this year and, and how we move forward um, with some of the things, the borrowing in particular, I think helped us in a great deal to allow us to have, as we look forward to next year, as much as possible a, a I don't want to call it a bare bone budget, but a budget that allows us to move forward uh, that we can, I think, given the revenue projections, we should be able to meet going forward next year without having the difficult conversations that we had this year and years past. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, uh, if we can do that, but at the same time begin to look forward about what needs to be done as we approach 2019 and 2020, 2021, I think that's going to go a long way towards that end. Senator Varlotta, are you optimistic as well that there might be a, a little bit of silver lining or a light at the end of the tunnel next year? Well, I mean, you can't borrow your way um, into any kind of prosperity. And I, I completely agree with both with everyone here on the panel about the tax structure has to be changed. Uh, we've got the second highest corporate net income tax in Pennsylvania in, in the entire country. Um, that doesn't represent a business-friendly environment trying to entice people to come into Pennsylvania. The other thing that we really have to acknowledge is that we have a regulatory problem in Pennsylvania. And we need to have a, a, a very serious discussion with our DEP, uh, not to change regulation, but for the love of Pete, can anyone who wants to do business in Pennsylvania get a permit to do so within a year and a half? We lost a, over a $500 million investment from a company um, that wanted to go into the Northeast, I believe, in, in Pennsylvania. Realized they, they got fed up with the whole permitting process, moved to, I think it was Wisconsin, if I'm not mistaken. Another one, almost $10 billion worth of investment, wanted to come into Pennsylvania. Again, there was no predictability whatsoever with any kind of permitting process to get the ball rolling. They're in Texas now. We chase away billions and billions of dollars every single year because we have unpredictability. We can't guarantee anyone, I don't care what industry they're in, that they can proceed with their investment, their capital investment in a timely fashion and move forward. They can get, people can get a permit for, for almost anything in, in Texas in a week. Sometimes in Louisiana, the people can walk into their DEP and walk out with a permit. We're not talking about lessening regulations. We've got some of the strictest regulations for environmental protection in Pennsylvania, and thankfully, that's great. I'm very happy about that. We've got a gorgeous state, and we want to keep it that way. But for the love of Pete, make it predictable and dependable and stop discouraging billions of dollars in investment coming into Pennsylvania. And I think our bottom line will look a lot different if we stop chasing industry away. Okay, and I want to build a little bit on this idea, sort of the state of the state more broadly than the budget. But before I do that, I want to remind everybody, in your folders, there's an index card. And we're going to get to the Q&A in just a few minutes, and then we're going to spend more, most of our time for the balance of our time until 1130 uh, getting your questions. But the way this is going to work uh, is not like a town meeting where everybody can get up and shout at them and everything. Uh, although I'm sure all four of these folks could easily handle that if we wanted to do that format. But no, you're going to write your questions on a card, and then I will go back up to the, the, the podium and sort of organize your questions, and we'll... Uh, uh, we'll sort of do it in a more orderly, civilized fashion, perhaps, than might otherwise be the case. But uh, so think about that. Start writing your questions. Charlie will be around. If you hold him up as he's wandering around, he'll pick him up. But yeah, uh, 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 Representative Frank, I wanted to go back to you and, and kind of what, think, look at where Pennsylvania is today and looking at some of the numbers that I put out there. What do you think uh, You know, we need to be doing in this state to really get it to where it should be? We have incredible assets, inc wonderful location. Higher education uh, uh, assets. We got workforce development. We've got technology. I mean, there's so much going for us, and we're ranking in the 30s as a state in terms of our economic performance. What do we have to do about that? Well, I agree with you. I mean, we have incredible assets. I mean, you take a look at Western Pennsylvania, uh, quality of life, how we've evolved, uh, how uh, uh, the kind of opportunities that exist here. Let's look at the things that have worked. You know. Uh, Higher education. We'll take a look at Western Pennsylvania. Our uh, our institutions of higher learning have been the engines in economic growth across the state, not just in Western Pennsylvania. Um, we have had uh, economic development because we've had collaboration 
uh, between the business community, government at the local and the state level over the years, nonprofit community, our foundations. It's been a great remedy. But one of those ingredients has stepped back, and that's, and that's the state. When you take a look at the economic growth and the transformation of Pittsburgh, uh, it is probably a poster child for why that kind of collaboration works. When you take a look at how we've transformed neighborhoods, when you look at East Liberty, you look at the South Side, you look at the technology center uh, along the uh, Monongahela River, uh, you look at uh, new developments like Somerset at Frick Park, those all took place because of that collaboration and the investments, quite frankly, that the state made in order to make those things trans transform. Would never happen. I, I do not think that, uh, that what has happened in Pittsburgh uh, would have taken place without critical investments uh, that were made uh, at the state level uh, as a partner. And we have stepped way back from that. Uh, the Department of Community and Economic Development, when I first came in, uh, compared to what it is today, it's about funded about 25% of what it was uh, back in uh, 1999. Uh, it is a small department. So we've taken away kind of the resources to make the investments. When you take a look at the investments that we make in higher education, higher education across the board, including community colleges, the state system of higher education, the, the state-related universities, uh, is down in real dollars 7% today, not this, this budget we passed uh, last year, from 2002 not including inflation, in real dollars. Our investments in basic education have remained flat during that period of time. Uh, these are the critical building blocks that, have, that are necessary in order for us to continue, uh, I think, to, make the, uh, to capitalize on the momentum uh, that we've had. So uh, I think that uh, we have to kind of reevaluate not just our tax system, and that's absolutely important, but in terms of what our priorities are. When we pass a budget, it's about what we value and our values. And I, uh, it, from my perspective, uh, we have made some, some choices that, that, that are contrary to what has proven to be successful uh, over uh, a long period of time. Uh, and we have to decide what is important, where we're going to make those investments, and, uh, and have that discussion. Uh, that was not part of what we talked about in this budget, and the budget is part of that process. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, my colleague at the uh, Greater Pittsburgh Chamber, Matt Smith, had a piece in the Business Time a couple of times a couple of weeks ago, some, uh, some analysis the conference did, that it kind of doesn't matter whether taxes go up and down or whatever you guys do. The state always collects 5.3% of total gross domestic product uh, in Pennsylvania going back forever. So the more the economy grows, the more money comes into the state to do all the good things that the state would like to do. There's a direct correlation there, but it's really based on this idea if the economy doesn't grow, uh, we, we can't tax our way out of it, basically. Yeah. Uh, uh, David, how about from your perspective? Where, where, where do we need to be? What do we need to be doing? You already talked about sort of the tax reform issue. Anything else on your mind? I, I think there are two basic things that are a little bit simplistic that are needed for us to actually be able to move forward. The one is a little bit of realism, and the second one is communication. Realism from the perspective, particularly in Western Pennsylvania, um, and it's starting to happen, but you can't go back in time. You can't recreate the industrial age of 100 years ago or 75 years ago or 50 years ago. You know, for far too many years, people sat on their hands and said, we want to go back to the good old days. Now. I'm fairly confident had we gone back to the good old days, many of those same folks would complain about the good old days because they weren't that good from their perspective. But as long as people want to go backwards, you don't have the opportunity to actually go forward. And you see this region starting to grow, starting to progress, starting to bring young folks back because we're realizing we have to go to a different economy. We are not competing small towns versus small towns in Western Pennsylvania. We are competing globally against other countries, not neighborhoods. And the second segment of it is communication. When folks communicate with one another, Republican, Democrat, labor and management, private sector, non-private sector, good things happen. Look at Harrisburg. When labor and industry got together and supported transportation funding, infrastructure funding, it happened. It got done, and it's making a world of difference in our communities. 
Look at the educational community. One of the things that we have struggled with for far too many years, we've got world-class educational institutions in this commonwealth, many of which never talk to one another. They don't. You have folks who protect their own fiefdoms at the expense of the folks they're looking to serve. A better coordination pre-K through postgraduate education and everything in between is needed if we're truly going to address workforce development in this commonwealth, in this region. When you look at the numbers put forth by the Allegheny Conference, the projections over the next 10, 15, 20 years, they're staggering. We have an entire generation of skilled laborers that are going to be retiring, and we have nobody to replace them. And look, that's partially our own fault, and I am a perfect example of that. I am the first in my family to ever go to college. It didn't matter whether I should have gone to college or should not have gone to college. My parents' generation, their sole goal was to put their child to college so that they had better opportunities than they had as children. In today's world, going to a four-year institution does not necessarily guarantee a better opportunity. The labor unions are doing a tremendous job with their apprenticeship programs, the coordination between community colleges and career and technical schools with actual industry leaders to produce a workforce that will gain, be gainfully employed immediately following graduation is amazing. The question is, how do we better communicate to translate those opportunities throughout our entire educational and business sector? We have that chance but we have to have folks in leadership positions, and not necessarily elected leadership positions, but leadership positions in the business sector and in the educational sector, in the labor sector, who are willing to sit around a table, have a conversation and saying, look, this time it may help hurt me a little bit, this time it may help you, but in the long run, we're all gonna gain if we coordinate these efforts together and make a concentrated effort to streamline the process so that we, when we have an opportunity like Amazon or a shell cracker plant, they're not questioning whether they have the workforce in existence in a state like ours to come in and actually get up and running as soon as possible. Thank you. Senator Costa, from your perspective, you could wave your wand and do the right thing for Pennsylvania to, to make us perform better. What, what do you think it should be? Well, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the things that we have done over the course of the last couple of years, particularly as it relates to the business tax climate. Um, you know, folks may, in this room may not realize we got rid of something called the net operating or the... Um, capital stock and franchise tax. It was a multi-billion dollar tax revenue that it took us a number of years to get rid of. Uh, it's an initiative that started many years ago, but each year we chipped away and got it done. We made major changes to the sales factor issue, uh, the single sales factor. Those are, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the work that has been done over the course of the past several years as it relates to the net, uh, net operating loss carry forward provisions and the changes that were made just recently. So we have done some things recognizing, even difficult fiscal years, we've done some things to try to enhance the opportunity for the business community to make investments in Pennsylvania. Uh, Dave talked about the collaboration working together. What I'd like to see as we go forward, more of that conversation. We talked about the um, we talked about the transportation funding proposal that we had worked together on. Uh, it was a coalition of labor and management. It was corporate community. It was the foundation community. It was a number of folks coming together. It's that type of model I think we have to do in a number of other areas to make certain that we can get bring consensus to some of these issues that we need to address, uh, not only to help a particular region or a particular industry, uh, but also to look at how we can best position ourselves and lay the platform uh, for us to be successful as we go forward. I remember when I first came to work for the Allegheny Conference back in 2001, one of the first things they told me about was the capital stock and franchise tax and how we were going to get that phased out. It was about uh, 12 years later. It, it finally happened, but actually if you look, I, I, I mentioned those terrible uh, competitive statistics ranking in the 30s for economic activity. If you actually look at tax burden and tax transparency in Pennsylvania, this is according to the Tax Foundation, we're now slightly better than average. And we used to be down in the 30s in in terms of the tax climate here. And that's been a meaningful change. Now, we're still barely above average, but it's, it's been a significant change. And it's really important, again, when you're trying to attract investment and get companies interested in Pennsylvania, that you not raise a red flag, that we're below average, at least. So it helps. Uh, as Senator Barlotti, I'll let you wrap up on this topic, what you'd really like to see happen next. And then we're going to open it up to the audience questions. Um, Pen Pennsylvania has so very, very much to offer in, in every single aspect. Um, for anyone who wants to raise a family here, bring a family here, bring industry here, 
Um, we just need to brag about it a lot more. Um, one of the, the reasons why I actually ran was I, I originally grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, so to, to move to southwestern Pennsylvania and see what neighborhoods really are supposed to be like and what communities are really supposed to be like, people talk to each other, they share history, folks go to their you know, grandparents' house for Sunday dinner and all that, that, doesn't, that never existed where I grew up. And to see that, that, that's the magic of making great people. Um, and that was the magic of southwestern Pennsylvania. And then I started seeing that disappear because we were losing really good family-sustaining jobs. Industries were closing up. People were moving away. And I think that the, res the result of that is a demographic that is uh, much older than, than most other cities. And it's, it's taking a while to, to bring that back again. And the pen pendulum is swinging a little bit the other way. But we really, really need to address so many aspects of what drives industry away and isn't welcoming. I already talked about the DEP issue, that's one thing. But if you really take a deep dive into even our building codes, even some of the regulations, even some of the things that our builders have to go through, the hoops they have to jump through to, uh, to even build something these days. Um, you know, different regulations for one, one category where a mirror gets placed on a wall it has to be so high, but if it's for a different facility, it's a different height. Uh, it, it's it's mind-boggling, and it, it's stifling. We really have to take a good look at that and clean up a whole lot of what we're doing. The other thing is we have spent, as a nation, at least one solid generation, maybe two generations, convincing kids that if you get your hands dirty at work, you're worth less. And that's crazy. Uh, calluses mean you worked hard that day. And we need to be sure we are telling our kids, even from an early age, look, you might not be a college-bound kind of a person, but there's nothing wrong with that. We've got to encourage kids, even in, in grade school all the way up, to experience and learn and, and be around all kinds of different careers, technology, technological uh, careers, vocational careers, you know, gone are the days of woodshop just being an elective to get you through because you needed so many electives in high school. Um, our greatest industry in Pennsylvania is agriculture. You say that to some kids and they think, I don't want to milk a cow. There's so much more involved. I mean, we need, we need engineers to design highly technical machinery to do things. And uh, it, it, agriculture can be sexy. Uh, along with all kinds of other manufacturing skills. So I think we really need to focus on um, providing that experience for all of our kids. And lastly, I think we need to stop. We need to allow teachers to teach, and we're not allowing that in Pennsylvania. We, we have our teachers not broadening the minds of kids, teaching kids how to learn. We're teaching them how to memorize because of all these mandated tests, and teachers are are frustrated, and it leaves no opportunity or time for any other kinds of courses in schools anymore. You, you see a lot of these public schools without art, without woodshop, without all of these other necessary things that broaden the mind and expose our kids to a lot of different things that they might really be passionate about and what could be a lifelong career. Very good. I'm going to go to questions now. I think the way we'll do this, because i got a lot. i got a lot of questions. So I will pose the question, and to maybe to one of you if it's directed that way. The other three can just sort of signal whether you want to build on it. But I'm not, going, I'm not going to ask all four of you to answer each question, all right? Or we'll never, ever get through this. But the first one that I want to talk about really builds on what the senator was just saying about the whole issue uh, around permitting and, uh, you know, some of the challenges that we have in Pennsylvania. And this is really one, and maybe you all want to answer this. So what can you do as leaders in the House and Senate to do a better job of uniting the efforts of agencies like uh, L and I, DCED, the environmental folks, to make sure the whole system works more effectively to benefit Pennsylvania. Senator, do you have any thoughts about that? Or is it just the governor's problem and you guys can just lob grenades at him? No. Well, um, one of the things that we really tackled a lot this past year was the fact that the governor had suggested merging four different, depart different departments, and that was health, human services, DDAP, uh, drug and alcohol, and aging. We had hearings across all of Pennsylvania for months and months and months, gathering information from all stakeholders and clients and everything else. Um, trying to combine uh, different departments, 
it might sound great at first first glance. And you know what? There are a lot of things that can be combined to save lots of money and a lot of paperwork and a lot of delay. Um, but you really have to, to dive deep and find out what are the unintended consequences. Uh, just because you, do, you combine a whole department with you know, other large ones, sometimes it's hard to get what you need out of one by itself. And when you make a huge conglomerate, is that really the best way to do things? But in my committee, we're actually looking at ways to streamline a lot of these different issues and make it a lot easier for people. Yeah. Senator from I think the Senator is right. Uh, there, uh, we went through a very thoughtful process, both in the Senate and the House, uh, looking at those four agencies to see what's right. But at the end of the day, what happens is then what we continue to have are these agencies operating in silos and not speaking to one another and not creating efficiencies that need to be done. Certainly, we have to look at the unintended consequences, but our goal should be working to make these agencies more efficient and the best way to provide the services. In this case, it's the delivery of services that we're talking about, making sure that we can deliver those services in the best possible way to the folks who are entitled to them. Now, one of the areas we did, uh, the administration move forward, was merging um, through a memorandum of understanding relates to the Department of Corrections and the Probation and Parole Agency. Uh, because what happens is we oftentimes have um, the parole department and the parole board making independent decisions about releasing someone from the correctional system, and then the correction system's over here uh, taking their time to be able to release that person and doing the steps that need to be done to get that person, whether it be back into the community, into a halfway home, or whatever the case might be. Uh, we have to streamline that because that, at the end of the day, impacts the revenue uh, that we expend to be able to keep somebody housed. That's just one example of something that can be done. But we have to start thinking along those lines and create those efficiencies in government to allow us to be able to expend the other, those resources that we're saving, uh, investing them in some of the things that we talked about, whether it be education, economic development, or whatever the case may be. But we have to be smarter about how we drive our agencies, and folks need to talk to one another. Yeah, and related to that, I don't know if, uh, if, if the representatives want to take this. You know, is, is the state the whole problem, or is there a problem at the local level in terms of the way permitting and regulation works? And is there anything the state can do to try to solve that, that issue for Pennsylvania? Well, I, I, I do think so. And I think, as uh, uh, Senator uh, Bartolotta uh, said, it's not necessarily the regulations themselves. It's the ability to do the enforcement. But that, again, is a consequence of not making the critical investments that we need to have. Enforcement is about having the, the complement of people out there to be able to efficiently and time, in a timely way address the permitting process, what other, uh, the other regulatory uh, issues that are facing businesses in the state. We have failed uh, to make the investments that are necessary to keep up with uh, the, uh, the 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 shale development in the state in terms of permitting, uh, we have gone the opposite direction. Instead of adding to the complement, we've been using uh, you know, basically reducing appropriations or keeping them flat for agencies that have increasingly important uh, responsibilities. And those, uh, the fact that we're not making those investments is really the reason that we have some of these issues. Uh, so uh, if we're not going to take, you know, government has some fundamental responsibilities. One of them is enforcement. But if you don't have the complement of people out there who are trained in order to do it, to be efficient and timely, you're going to create a bottleneck uh, that makes it impossible for us to do uh, what is the expectation uh, in the business community and from the public in terms of keeping people safe and balancing that with making sure that we can have uh, the kind of economic development that is necessary in the state. Uh, but you can't have that. Uh, without having uh, government staffed and funded at the appropriate level. We have failed to do that. Okay, so, so again, the state, but I mean, those, some of those same issues come into play at the local level because we have, uh, I mean, different municipalities have different capacity to be able to enforce their own regulations. I mean, how much, David, how much of this is the sort of a state versus a local issue in terms of making it all work better? I think as long as we're making it a state versus local versus federal government issue, we're never going to solve the problem. Um, <laughs> The problem is caused by each and every one of us, you too, by our acceptance of a lack of leadership and our fear of change that leads to the common denominator being the status quo. Because people are safe and secure in that of which they know. And that lack of leadership, that's not directed at any particular elected official, but it's all elected officials. It's agency heads. It's local committees and commissions. 
It's folks within departments, within nonprofit agencies, within the educational community. Those who are, are succeeding are those who have leaders who are willing to take risks, who are willing to question why do we continue to do the same thing we've done for 30 years. You know, that's part of this discussion with merging departments in Harrisburg. I am shocked at how many people complain about the bureaucracy in state government and then somebody actually proposes to change that bureaucracy. Oh, no, we can't change anything with that department. It's working perfectly fine. Well, you've been complaining about it for decades. How can you not look at that and say, let's try something different? Government does not do that very well because the public does not accept change very well. We may make mistakes, but I'd rather make mistakes trying something new than just accepting the status quo that continues to get us poor results. That's on us, collectively, as a populace, not being willing to try new things. You know, it's like I've got three young kids. I've got a third grader, a second grader, and a kindergartner. Every night we try to get them to try new things at the dinner table. And in fairness, I'm a fairly picky eater, so my wife's doing the same, th same to me most nights. But like, how can we ever expect them to try new things if we're not willing to try new things ourselves? And then on top of that, we complain about where things are at today. I'd rather make a mistake, get back up, try something different, and continue to move forward until we find a better process. That exists across the board in government. Doesn't matter what level, doesn't matter which department. We see it play out a great deal in our anti-poverty efforts, both at the state level and at the federal level. And I know Dan and I have talked a little bit about that with the Institute of Politics with the University of Pittsburgh. We've got to be willing to adapt. We've got to be willing to change. We've got to be willing to actually take a risk and see where it may take us. Um, I, I, and I promised you no more budget questions, but the audience still has budget-related questions. So I'm going to try to work a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of them together. But the point the, the, point the, the, the questioner is making is the late budgets we've seen in recent years are damaging our higher ed and many, many areas dependent on special programs like tax credits. There's so much uncertainty. We saw it at the University of Pittsburgh in recent weeks as nobody knew if they were going to get funded or not. Um, in the context of the Amazon pitch that was being made, which was all about workforce and, and, and technology and innovation. Uh, you know, what can be done to get this process done on time? And, and then related to that, you know, are you satisfied with the capability in Harrisburg right now to work together? Or is it getting more and more polarized and more and more difficult? And what do we do about all of this to be more effective and more efficient in making sure there's some, uh, some s security uh, about how the budget's going to get done? Who wants to start? <laughs> Senator Costa, you mentioned the, po the sort of the polarization issue. So. <laughs> so I think, unfortunately, the polarization has taken place more so uh, the last several years than I think I've seen in the past. Uh, I think it's because the nature of the outcome of the elections, where it's moving folks further apart and making it more difficult to come together. Um, so I think we have to figure out a way to address that. Certainly on the process, there have been conversation about process reform so that we don't allow folks to find themselves in the same position as they did, particularly in 2015 and 16 when, you know, schools weren't getting their money, nonprofit and, and providers weren't getting paid. Uh, we didn't do that this time around. We moved forward with the spending plan and we're driving those dollars down. But we cannot create the uncertainty. I will tell you just for example, uh, when you talked about economic development, um, we missed a whole summer and early fall uh, of, and in probably going into next year as well, of uh, construction season. And uh, I know, you know, Bill Watercott's here with his guys, and, you know, they've missed out on a great number of opportunities because, for example, a program referred to as the RCAP program uh, that provides, you know, as a partner with the, the private sector creating and building things in this community and across this Commonwealth. You know, we didn't make any of those announcements today, so they delayed projects for many, many months, and they still may not happen. So when we make these type of decisions, not bringing closure to some of these issues uh, into our budget, it, it, it impacts a lot of folks along those lines. The uncertainty about the University of Pittsburgh and the state related was certainly unfortunate, and, um, and we have to move forward beyond that to make sure that uh, they don't become hostage to our conversation, because um, that's what's happened in years past. But, you know, at the end of the day, we had to figure out a way to not put ourselves in this position, and that's why as we work together uh, to build a consensus in this process, we have to really force ourselves to get something done uh, by our timeline, which is June 30th. My hope is, I know we learned a lesson from 15, 16, 
that conversation for that budget year. My hope is that we learned a lesson in terms of the way we conduct our process as we go forward. Um, but it requires us to work together. And as I mentioned at the outset, you know, being able to have to accept things that you otherwise uh, may not want to accept and deal with. And, and all four parties in the front office uh, have to recognize that as well. And I think it, we finally came to that conclusion, I think, last, this week. Anybody else want to pick up on that? Or, yes, that? Well, and just to piggyback on what Senator Costa said, we have to do this a different way. Uh, and I think a performance-based budget is really the way to go. And we as... For people who don't know oh, what I'm a performance-based budget is. It's, it's kind is. of what you guys, you know, it, just imagine in your own home, let's say this last year you needed a new roof and maybe new carpeting because it leaked and it ruined. Okay, fine. Well, next year when you set out to, to figure out how much you're going to need for your, for your budget, for your, for your home, you're not going to add the cost of a roof. We do that in Pennsylvania. These departments come to us and say, well, this is what we spent last year, and I'd like that plus 5% every year. We need, we, I'd love to have a zero-based budget, but I don't think we're ever going to get that, but at least performance-based. Every department that comes forward with their handout, what did you do with the money you did with, we gave you last year? What were your one-time-only projects? Don't include that in this year's budget. Were you successful with what you did with the funding? Why do you need the same this year? That's where we need to be. And I think that would save hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in, in waste because, and everybody knows this happens, closer to the end of the fiscal year, there are departments scrambling to figure out a way to spend everything they got the year before. And that's a problem. Okay. Um, I actually, uh, one, one, one person actually wants to thank you all for something. So <laughs> I have one, one card that's not a complaint. <laughs> it says, thanks to all of you, all of the panelists, for your bipartisan work on historic pension reform, uh, an important step forward. But some of our local communities are still struggling with the issue of, of, uh, the, of pensions. Is municipal pension reform on the horizon in any way? Dan, you want to start with that? Well, it's something that uh, certainly has been discussed. Uh, it's, it was kind of put to the side because we were focused on doing uh, pension reform at the state level, uh, which we accomplished on a bipartisan basis. But the fact of the matter is we have a time bomb ticking across this state uh, at every level of uh, local government. Um, we have in Pennsylvania uh, more uh, uh, pension, uh, municipal and uh, local pension funds than, uh, than any other state in the country. Uh, we have 25% of all uh, local government pension funds in Pennsylvania, more than 3,200. Uh, they need uh, reform. Many of them have uh, members, uh, you know, half a dozen or a dozen members and retirees. Uh, the costs, the individual costs uh, for many of those pension funds exceed per member over $1,000 a year per member. Uh, it is unsustainable, and uh, we have to look at uh, reform. Much of it will have to do with looking at a way to consolidate them, uh, to force uh, local governments into consolidating uh, at the, with the Pennsylvania Municipal uh, Pension System uh, as one opportunity that's already out there, that's a, a, an opportunity for pension systems to get efficiencies, to get professional management uh, at, at an economies of scale uh, that would help solve the problem. Um, but as long as we have this kind of uh, uh, disparate uh, system that is not replicated in any state in this country, uh, the number of local pension funds has got to be consolidated and we have to be able to enforce discipline among them with professional management and lower costs. And I think that's one of the things that I, I hope is on the agenda. Uh, as we go down the road here, because it is really uh, an extraordinary uh, time bomb ticking there that, uh, that we've got to address. We see it. We have discussions about what's happening at Pitts in Pittsburgh. The city of Pittsburgh is a large pension system that uh, has made some strides to address it, address their unfunded liability, uh, but they still have a long way to go as well. Anybody else on that one? Huh? Uh, Jay? Just very briefly, I think, you know, the conversations have been taking place. I know in the House, I think there was a hearing scheduled this week, but I think it was postponed because of the budget conversation. But these conversations on municipal pensions have been taking place, and they will continue to take place, and I think they will be a priority. At the end of the day, though, as was with the state pension system back in 2010 when we did Act 120 and when we just did most recent pension reform, uh, folks got to come together, and, and both sides got to recognize um, that they cannot 
you know, win everything. It's got to be a compromise, and it's going to be tough. And is that, whether it be the budget, whether it be pensions, or whatever it might be, folks have to recognize, and we don't do this well enough, I think. We have to accept that we got to compromise and figure out ways to be able to do that. So the level of compromise and willingness to participate in a compromise will determine whether or not we address municipal pension system anytime soon. Thanks. Yeah, no, thinking back to my days as a personal finance reporter, I just have to believe that having lots of itty-bitty pension plans, the fees must eat those people alive who are participating in those plans at the municipal level. So not dealing with this is kind of doing a disservice to the retirees who are depending on those plans. It eats into their return. So. Well, Bill, there's a lot of folks who are very protective of those fees, and that becomes an issue that we have to deal with overcoming that as well. Hmm. When you look at it on the merits, it certainly makes sense that we should address it, but there are other interests that, that, that position themselves, whether um, in this area and in other areas, that you know make it difficult for that to happen. Hmm. And uh, along that note, just I, I think if we're going to be doing that, I think we really need to look, take a look at who's managing the pension fund for the state of Pennsylvania, because it's costing us $750 million a year to, do, to get a return on that investment that's less than if you stuffed it in a mattress. Hmm. Just saying. Plenty to think about there. I got a, a shell-related question. I guess it's not too surprising. Somebody would bring it up. But it's kind of in the context of, of some of the findings that were in the inflection point report that the Allegheny Conference released last year. There's been a lot of talk about the 300,000 baby boomers leaving the workforce and, and about the need to find young people and others to upskill people to fill that gap. The other piece of the report that didn't get as much attention is that the finding was that the other million jobs these are the people that are still here and are going to keep working through that period, are all going to be obsolesced over the next 10 years, mostly through technology, changes in workplace, changes in the way everybody does business. And so there's this ongoing issue around how do we keep people prepared to adjust to the rapid changes that are happening. So related to that and, and, the, and, and the kind of framing that for the Shell Cracker question, that this is going to bring jobs to the region and that's terrific. But how do we make sure that once people get those jobs, they don't become obsolesced and that we keep up as, as the technology changes, whether it's the energy industry or whether it's autonomous vehicles, that, that we don't wind up back in the same position we are right now with a mismatch between skills and, and what employers need to be able to do business here. Anybody have any thoughts about that? And what the state can do, obviously, to help bridge that gap. Yeah. Dave. Well, look, I, I think we talked about it a little bit earlier. The days of the state or federal government dictating what workforce development looks like need to be gone. Um, we provide funds. We provide programs. There's 50-some workforce development programs in the state of Pennsylvania. Nobody can name them all or what they do, and most of them don't coordinate with each other. What we should do is take the funds that we spend on workforce development and drive it back locally to the local workforce uh, job training providers in conjunction with the industries because and look i not like i'm an expert in this region but you know you can't just train a welder to be a welder and expect that every company well that's a welder that welder will fit into your company people want welders trained specifically for what they're doing within their own uh, manufacturing facility uh, we're going to have to be more precise in the workforce we're developing and there's going to have to be this realization that you don't necessarily start at the company at the age of 18 and retire at the age of 65. Those days are gone. You know, people are going to transition from job to job to job over a lifetime, and which is also why, you know, there's some benefits to changing our retirement system, that we went from the traditional pension system to a 401k system in the private sector, because you have no confidence that that company you started with at the age of 18 is still going to be there to pay out that pension at the age of 65. That's why the private sector is ahead of the public sector. It's not just dollars and cents. It's from a worker's perspective, knowing that the company is going to be there to pay out that pension one day down the road. Like Our mentality entering the workforce is going to have to change that we as workers have a responsibility to keep up with the times, not just the companies, but we have to continue to develop day after day after day. The job that we start with is not going to be the job that we end with. The skill set that we start with is not going to carry us through a lifetime. We have a responsibility to keep up our workforce development through that lifetime if we do not want to be obsolete at the end. Anybody else want to build on that or challenge that? I think yes. it says it very well. I just think we have to, as this Commonwealth, we can't dictate what and predict and, and protect that the workforce position we create now. We have to be um, 
nimble. We have to be flexible as we go forward and allow the industry and technology to continue to do what they need to do to continue to grow and expand. We just, you know, we have, and then we have to be prepared as a commonwealth to make the investments to, to help them be in a position to allow us to work with folks to be able to adopt to what needs to be, what needs to be done along those lines. Well, so the other thing we have to realize, too, we have got some of the most phenomenal building trades in Pennsylvania, and we should be so proud of them. And what they do is they do so much outreach, not just with community colleges and things, but high schools as well, and they try really hard to get the message out. Look, you know, we can train you for for a wonderful career that will last you almost a lifetime, depending on where the 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 journey takes you, um, but but they work so well and they have such a great message, um, and even retraining veterans, uh, the work that they do with our veterans is phenomenal. So we really need to brag them up, and we really need to take their message to our high schools and get them in there to work with these kids at a young age and show them what's available. Um, and even you know uh, what was said earlier was at one time the displaced steel workers. We're having to learn new skills. Well, now we've got coal miners, hundreds and hundreds of coal miners out of work that know how to work really, really hard. And we need to focus also on retraining a lot of those folks. Uh, so it's not just new people learning new skills, it's retraining and getting new careers even after you've been in the workforce. Well, you have that managing your own career, and then you have that sudden thing that happens that you're forced out maybe that you weren't expecting, and the coal miners have kind of found themselves in that position, Dan. Yeah, I'm, when you take a look at the statistics, you look at, you know, 20% of the workforce is gonna be replaced by automation in the next five years. More than 50% by 2050. Um, and we need to figure out what, where, what we're gonna do uh, in order to train people. It's going to be very difficult if you're 50, 60 years old. You know, getting those new skills is, is going to be a very difficult transition. But we need to be focused uh, on K-12 to uh, to be able to have individuals who are going to be able to be not just trained, uh, but have the flexibility and the intellectual capacity uh, to kind of change over time. I mean, the, 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 as others have noted, you know, you don't have one career uh, over a lifetime anymore. There are many careers often, three or four jobs, even completely different careers. So we've talked a lot about STEM education uh, being something that we ought to be emphasizing uh, at K to 12 and in our higher education uh, system, particularly community colleges. But we also need to be training uh, children and young adults with soft skills, uh, skills that deal with interpersonal relationships, being able to manage people, being able to uh, communicate, uh, these are skills that are absolutely essential in a modern workplace uh, that I think we're missing the boat on. And I think that those are some of the things that we need to be focused on to give people the capacity uh, to, to be able to transition and roll the punches in an economy that none of us ever, you know, as I was growing up, ever expected to see uh, things change as rapidly uh, as they are today. And we are talking about 50% uh, of jobs today being replaced by automation in the next 30 years. It's a stunning statement, and we need to be prepared for it. We need to make sure that we have uh, young people today being prepared for not just being trained for a career, but being able to be trained for an opportunity to be able to be flexible, change, have the soft skills that help f facilitate that, and we need to have some focus on that. And I think. Uh, our higher education system, our K-12 system, we've got to be making those kinds of uh, things a priority and making those investments. Yeah, I think about the self-driving cars. Uh, if right. anything, we're as well positioned as anybody to be on the frontier of figuring out how to deal with these issues because we're inventing the technologies here in southwestern Pennsylvania that are transforming workplaces and manufacturing and transportation. So we ought to be able, hopefully, to, to work through this and figure it out. Uh, we've only got about 10 minutes left, uh, but there's one question that came up that I think is, given the nature of this forum, is absolutely worth a little bit of discussion. I'm going to ask all four of you to, to uh, respond to this. Often the state's pro-union policies are viewed as impediments to economic growth. Uh, project labor agreement, right to work status, all those types of things. What do you think? Should we do more in Pennsylvania to be more like other states when it comes to our attitude about uh, unions and collective bargaining and right to work and all that kind of stuff? Who wants to start? Jay? I'll go first. Uh, <laughs> no. 
I think that we have been over the last several years developing very positive working relationships and, and partnerships with uh, folks in labor as it relates to things that need to be done. Uh, we mentioned earlier the, the transportation funding legislation. Uh, that was a collaboration of labor and management and the corporate community and so many others coming together. And both sides were beneficial in things. Um, the, there were changes that were made to the prevailing wage law uh, that the labor didn't particularly care for, but were part of the overall package that needed to, be, to get done. Um, so it's the give and take that's taken place over the years. The investments that we've talked about, you know, through labor and industry, we have job training programs. Our apprenticeship programs are outstanding, and we're able to make investments there to be able to prepare the workforce. We work closely with uh, Bill Watercott and the Carpenter guys who do a great job. Uh, we're preparing the workforce as we go forward, and I don't know necessarily that that being the case, their programs and them as unions and entities uh, are an impediment for us to be able to do good things in Pennsylvania. Okay. Somebody else? Modifying our stance on unions, Dan? I would absolutely agree with that. Look, organized labor has been a foundation for the middle class. Uh, and uh, they have lifted up uh, uh, a whole generations of folks uh, in our community. And the balance has quite frankly shifted. Uh, there has been a, a, a deliberate effort to undermine uh, the power of uh, organized labor uh, across this country. And uh, it is something that I think uh, is shifted uh, you know, this balance in a way that has severely impacted uh, working families' ability to provide uh, for a better life. Uh, organized labor did that for generations. Uh, they're an important ingredient. Uh, this, this, this form itself is a part of a collaboration uh, between management and labor, business and labor. That's the type of environment we need. But there needs to be an ability to negotiate uh, on uh, an even balance. There needs to be a balance. It's worked in the past. I think it can work in the future. We need to have uh, working people have the capacity uh, to negotiate uh, fair terms with their employers. That's got to shift today because it's a different work kind of a workplace. Uh, so we're seeing that happen as efforts are to organize uh, workers uh, in different sectors like healthcare. Uh, but that, but there needs to be a balance, and it can't be just one-sided. I don't think we've looked at uh, historically uh, when you give uh, any uh, side of that equation uh, unequal uh, negotiating power, uh, do you get a fair outcome? So uh, I believe that the organized labor is an absolutely critical element uh, to uh, a successful workplace uh, and workforce. Uh, they also provide educational opportunities. And as Jay noted, with respect to being able to train people, particularly in the trades, in healthcare, in other places, they are an absolutely essential tool uh, in this whole issue about workforce readiness. Dan, how about it? How do we? Oh, Senator, you start oh, first. No, uh, yeah, striking that balance. No, just I, again, I mean, like I said before, um, it, we wouldn't be anywhere if it weren't even for for our building trades, and we we need them, and we need skilled people. We need places where folks can go and be trained incredibly well. Um, you know, they, they're safe, they're, they're efficient, they show up. They're, it, it's, it's amazing um, to me that, uh, and, and I know it's shocking as a Republican to hear, <laughs> to hear somebody say that, uh, but I, I, I value uh, the commitment that they have to um, economic development, um, and we need them. And one of the things that I had, that one of the first meetings I had was at the Steelworkers Union when I first took office, and I said, how are you prepared for the cracker plant if it happens? And they said, well, we're going to have to be pulling people from Tennessee. We don't have enough people here. So, you know, the, the value that they, they bring to any kind of a project in Pennsylvania is really tremendous. Um, and it, it shouldn't be a party thing. Um, just like today's panel, just like a lot of the issues that we, we tackle, we have, we have a common goal, and sometimes we, we get there a different way. But I think all oars in the water lead us in the right path. I think when you look at the, the, the public labor versus business fight, what you really have is a, a fight uh, that is waged through buzzwords uh, that each side has developed to frighten people in the general populace. And generally, the folks fighting are folks who are not actually within those particular sectors but make a lot of money on ensuring that that fight continues. 
you know, foundations, you know, shadow groups, everything else, and it happens on both sides of the spectrum. Um, that generally is what our elections have become about, you know, shadow money showing up to influence and scare people that the world is in. It. The reality of what labor versus management should be, it shouldn't be a labor versus management, it should be labor and management. And I actually think the point that Dan made uh, hits the nail on the head. It's really a pendulum. If the pendulum swings too far one way or the other, you have a problem. If management has too much power, you have a problem. If labor has too much power, you have a problem. And we have examples of that playing out firsthand in Western Pennsylvania over the last 50 years on both sides of the spectrum. We have to find a way to navigate all those outside interest groups to actually bring the pendulum back to somewhere in the center so one side doesn't get out of whack with the other side. Because that's the only way you can have an economy actually work. That's the only way you can develop a workforce and have businesses for that workforce to actually go to work in. That pendulum gets out of whack. We allow all that white noise that folks are making millions, if not billions of dollars out of to dominate the landscape. We are going to head in the wrong direction. Okay, only two questions left. I'm only going to ask one of you, whoever wants to, to answer the first one, but all four of you get to answer the last question. Had a couple of questions, actually, related to LGBTQ and why the state uh, can't ever pass legislation giving them full protections in terms of housing, employment, and stuff like that. What's, what's the issue in Pennsylvania? Why hasn't that happened? Why isn't that happening, Dan? Thanks. Uh, well, uh, it's, <laughs> as somebody who's been... Uh, Part of leading this fight for the last, uh, since I walked in the door in the legislature, uh, it is, again, one of the things that uh, I find so disappointing. Um, we need to be a state that embraces tolerance and equal opportunity and equal rights for every Pennsylvanian. That is not the case today. Uh, the fact of the matter is, in many parts of the state, in, you, know, you can fire somebody uh, deny them housing, deny them educational opportunities, deny them access to public accommodations because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. We are the only state in the entire Northeast quadrant that doesn't provide these civil rights protections. And I think as you look at it from an economic standpoint, when folks are looking to invest in Pennsylvania, and my guess is when Amazon is making their list of issues uh, and making their decision. One of those issues will be whether there is a comprehensive civil rights bill or law on the books in your state. Uh, what has been one of the great things that I've seen evolve over the last uh, dozen years is the fact that the business community has stepped up and recognizes this. So the Allegheny Conference, the Pittsburgh Chamber, the Philadelphia Chamber, have embraced this and recognize that how vital it is uh, for our economic well-being, let alone the issue of civil rights and fairness, that Pennsylvania needs to be perceived as a place that embraces tolerance and civil rights for every Pennsylvanian. And uh, so I'm optimistic uh, as I look at the legislation that I introduced, uh, say, 10 years ago. Uh, there may have been 20 co-sponsors. Today, nearly half of the legislature, including uh, Republicans uh, and Democrats, uh, have have done that. Uh, people's hearts and minds have changed uh, over the years. The advocacy effort has uh, has uh, done that. We've also had the opportunity in the legislature to have uh, two individuals, a Republican and a Democrat, who are members of the LGBT community. So when you're sitting next to somebody, when you get to know somebody from that community, I think your heart and your mind do change. So I'm optimistic that we'll get there. I'm hoping that uh, our leadership uh, will agree to bring uh, these bills to the floor and have that debate. Um, it's about time it's, uh, that Pennsylvania join uh, this community uh, of uh, tolerance uh, for every Pennsylvanian, of civil rights and equal opportunity for every Pennsylvanian. That's something we ought to be doing. It's good for everybody uh, and it's good for business as well. Seriously, the only state in the Northeast the that, only doesn't, state have, in the that Northeast. doesn't have a comprehensive civil rights uh, law of that's some sort. Yes. Wow. For a, for a state that's really struggling to attract and retain young people of all kinds, that's... Well, you know, it's exactly right. When you look, <laughs> when you look at the new economy, when you look at the, the, the folks that are making investments, 
uh, you know, my guess is many, many of those people don't, don't know that that's the case. Uh, but, uh, but those, the, the employees that are being attracted expect that to be reflected in their community, and it's not. So we've got to change that. All right. I have one final question that all four of you will have to answer, and this is from the audience. Who do you like tomorrow, Penn State or Ohio State? <laughs> Senator? <laughs> oh, that's loaded. <laughs> <laughs> Go Steelers. <laughs> so as a pit trustee for a number of years, I am, I am going to be support, certainly supporting Penn State. I want to make certain that uh, I'm hopeful that maybe we can go to a bowl game at some point in time at the end of this year. So we'll see. Is that from Chuck Coley in that question? <laughs> no initials. Yeah, Dave. Look, I'm the same guy who thought the Pirates were going to win the World Series for the last 25 <laughs> years. So, of course, I'm going to go with Penn State. I'm forever the optimist. Even though I went to college uh, in Ohio, not Ohio State, uh, I am uh, yeah, absolutely uh, loyal to uh, Penn State uh, in Pennsylvania and uh, you know, wish them the best. Yeah, and I, I, as I, I'll leave you all with one, one quick thought because it builds on everything we've been talking about. For those who might doubt that Pennsylvania could ever solve all these problems and be the best economic performer in the country, anybody want to guess, according to that governing.org study that I referenced at the beginning, what the number one performing state was? in terms of total economic performance? Ohio? Texas? No, it was actually Massachusetts. A very blue state with a Republican governor had the total economic performance uh, that surpassed the rest of the states in the United States in terms of creating opportunity for everybody who lives there. So something to think about. Thanks to our panelists for really a wonderful conversation. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Bullock. Please join me in giving a round of applause to Bill Flanagan for engaging our panelists in the very intellectual conversation. And let's also extend another special thank you to our panelists as well. All right. We've had a great discussion, and I want to thank all of you for supporting us. We also look forward to seeing all of you in the spring. The topic will be announced shortly. We ask that you invite and bring another person with you to help us further advance our lecture series on some meaningful topics that will impact us all. Members of the advisory committee, we would like to ask for you to please come to the, to the stage to take a photo with our guest panelists and uh, members of the, facilitated by uh, Bill Flanagan. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. <laughs>